Dragon Age Origins, a game that was my first step into the diverse, dangerous, and mythical continent of Thetis. Thetis is a world always on the brink of disaster, and Dragon Age has delivered some really great stories over the years, be they overarching narratives that stretch multiple games, or personal, self-contained stories that hyper-focus on individual characters. These kinds of narratives have kept me invested in the Dragon Age world for well over a decade. A decade spent reading novels, graphic novels, lore books, and wiki articles. It's a series that means a lot to me. So join me as I dive into why I love Dragon Age Origins. Many years ago, when I was a much younger gamer, like now, I rarely ventured beyond my already established horde of games. At this time, I was only playing the Elder Scrolls and Fallout, bouncing between Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim, New Vegas, and Fallout 3. After many years of this, I had exhausted my opportunities for adventures in the lands of Tamriel and the wastelands of the United States. It was early one day, and I had a few hours before I had to leave for work. I sat on the floor of the bedroom because my room was tiny. I only had a bed and a TV in there with an exceedingly janky entertainment center and one bookshelf, which held a couple of games. You know, as I say in all these videos, I, I grew up quite poor, so I never had a ton of games. And at this time in my life, I can't remember exactly when this was, but it was a teenager. I had left high school, well, dropped out, really. I didn't have a lot of money, and I was working odd jobs here and there just trying to help out with the bills. Luckily for me, I had a few dollars to spare on this particular day, and I was looking for something new. Anything where I had some choice, consequence, and interesting stories. Really, I was looking for something that gave me the same feelings I had when I played New Vegas. I was on Xbox Live at the time. I wasn't a gold member. I couldn't afford that. I was a silver member, which was just, congrats, you're poor, but at least you have internet. It worked fine for me, though. I didn't play multiplayer games, just RPGs. So in the midst of my search for a game to play, I came across the store page for Dragon Age Origins. It looked like a pretty intense fantasy game, but at that moment, I had no idea what I was getting into. In the Fifth Blight, the Warden was the hero of Ferelden, a castless dwarf from Orzammar. Branded by the unbending rules of Orzammar society, the hero was forced into a life of crime. My first steps into Thetis came by way of playing a human noble warrior. Very original, I know. But that first step into Thetis took me by surprise. Before the game starts, you get a playable origin story, which is the prologue for your character, and each origin has relevance in the main story as well. They are human noble, human mage, elven mage, dalish elf, city elf, a dwarven royalty, or a castless dwarf. No matter what you choose, and no matter how insignificant it may seem, your origin will have an impact on the world and it will tie into the main story. Think of it almost like your character having their own companion quest or loyalty mission within the story itself. It's an amazing touch that I, I wish would come back. Playable origins were so cool. For centuries, we have kept our vigil. We have watched and waited for the Darkspawn to return. There are those who have doubted, who have forgotten. Long before I was playing Dragon Age, I played Mass Effect. At this point, I think I'd only played Mass Effect 1, and I, I can't remember if I had played 2 or not yet. So, I had an idea of how like interconnected worlds worked in games, at least in the sense that your choices from one game to another carried on. I know, at least before I was playing Mass Effect 2, I had read that feature. So when I first discovered Dragon Age and started playing Origins, this was around the time the Legacy Story DLC dropped for Dragon Age 2, I believe. I was excited to see that there was a sequel, and that my choices would matter in that game as well. That was one of the things that really made me weigh each decision, because I wasn't sure how the world of Thetis itself would be affected. While I won't be covering Dragon Age 2 or Dragon Age Origins in this video, I would encourage you to play both. 
This is a series that has some serious replay value between these three games. Trying different origins and choices can really impact some of the situations Hawk or the Inquisitor may find themselves in come their respective journeys. From this moment forth, you are a Grey Warden. Regardless of your background or choices made in your origin story, your character is accepted into the Grey Wardens. The Grey Wardens are an ancient order originating from the lands of the Anderfels and Thetis' distant past. They're an order dedicated to one thing and one thing only, fighting Darkspawn and protecting the world from the Blight. I suppose that's two things. Depending on who you ask and what origin you pick, joining the Wardens can be many things. A great honor, a last chance at glory, a way to avoid punishment, or it can be the punishment. Upon joining the Wardens, there is no time to waste. The Warden Commander of Ferelden, the furthest southern nation of Thetis, is a man named Duncan. Duncan believes a blight is on the horizon, and at this moment, we are going to take a quick detour and delve into one of my favorite things about the world of Dragon Age, the lore. But it is the hubris of men which brought the Darkspawn into our world. Long ago, there were seven old gods. To my knowledge, they aren't actually confirmed to be literal gods or deities, but they were nonetheless powerful beings. They took the form of massive dragons, or they were massive dragons capable of speech and magic. These old gods were Dumat, the dragon of silence, Zazikel, the dragon of chaos, Toth, the dragon of fire, Andoral, the dragon of slaves, Urthemiel, the dragon of beauty, Razakael, the dragon of mystery, and Lusican, the dragon of night. These dragons allegedly taught magic to the ancient human tribes inhabiting northern Thetis, the Neromenians, who would go on later to form the kingdoms of Neromenian, Carinus, Berendur, and Tevinter, the former being the original tribe of humans in Thetis, and the latter going on to become Thetis's most powerful and influential culture for centuries, as well as its most historically significant. At some point, the magisters of the Tevinter Imperium became so powerful they sought to usurp heaven, but instead, they destroyed it, being cast back to the world as the first Darkspawn. These Darkspawn are infected with the Darkspawn taint, a sickness that infects everything. Humans, elves, dwarves, animals, and poisons the very land itself, turning it into barren wasteland. Darkspawn search endlessly for the old gods. When they find one, they infect it with the taint and it becomes an archdemon, a massive darkspawn dragon that takes on the role of the hive mind and leader. Capable of unifying the darkspawn horde and leading them, this event is called a blight. By the time of Dragon Age Origins, there have been four blights in the history of Thetis, led by Dumat, Zazikel, Toth, and Andoral respectively. During the start of Origins, Urthemiel, the Dragon of Beauty, has been awakened and taken control of the Darkspawn. This is where you come in. Warriors and mages, barbarians and kings, the Grey Wardens sacrificed everything to stem the tide of darkness and prevail. The Grey Wardens were formed during the height of the First Blight. At this point, the Darkspawn had mostly overrun the world. It's unknown how the Wardens were founded, and their joining rituals are secrets which are closely guarded. I won't give any spoilers as to how one becomes a Grey Warden. Suffice to say, the Grey Wardens have led the world against four blights, each one being a costly campaign. Costly in the lives of soldiers, craftsmen, and of course, resources. The most recent blight, the fourth blight was almost 400 years ago by the start of Dragon Age Origins. In the fourth blight, so many Darkspawn were killed that people just assumed the threat was over for good. In those 400 years, the prominence and numbers of the Grey Wardens have diminished greatly in the nations of Thetis, but nowhere has the thinned ranks been felt as harshly as the southernmost nation of Ferelden. You become a Grey Warden. A soldier in a war against an enemy that has harried the world since its earliest days. In addition to that, you're in a country where the Grey Wardens are not particularly well staffed and now you're facing the might of the upcoming Fifth Blight. Urthemiel, the Dragon of Beauty, has awakened and the Horde is amassing. Nobody believes it's a real Blight, just an unusually large Darkspawn raid on the surface. But the Grey Wardens know the real threat behind this menace. We will be traveling south through the hinterlands to the ruin of Ostagar, on the edges of the Korkari Wilds. 
I try to avoid spoilers as much as I can in these videos, and this one will be no different. But after you go through your origin story, which is essentially a brilliant story-driven tutorial section, you arrive at the ruined fortress of Ostagar on the edge of the Kokari Wilds. Despite its status as a formerly abandoned Tevinter fortress, it's still an incredibly strategic and defensible position, and the kingdom of Ferelden is mustering everything it can there for the campaign to fight the Darkspawn. Here in Ostagar, you will be introduced, albeit briefly, to a host of different groups and characters that will play a large part in the story. While you can choose to interact with or ignore them at your discretion, you will meet King Caelan Theron, the King of Ferelden, Terran Loghain Mactir, the Terran of Guarin, war hero from Ferelden's War of Independence against the Empire of Orlais, and Ferelden's greatest general and strategist. You will meet the Circle of Magi and one of their senior enchanters, Wynne, the Templar Order, who act as guardians and police over the mages of the Circle, and the Andraste Enchantry, the foremost church and religious body in Thedas. While here, you will also meet Alistair, a junior member of the Grey Wardens. Alistair has been a Warden for roughly six months now. While by no means seasoned, he is, at least to start, your direct handler, so to speak. Moving more down the ladder, you'll meet two other Grey Warden recruits, each from vastly different walks of life, and they have different reasons for joining the Wardens, or wanting to join. Sir Jory is a knight and warrior, and Davith is a rogue and thief of ill repute. Originally, I had these really long character biographies written in this section for them, but I feel like these would take away the luster of learning about them for yourself. Suffice to say, these two characters, and this is a tiny spoiler, so my apologies, but these two characters are not integral to the plot at all. I won't say why, but suffice to say, you won't get much interaction with them compared to other characters. In the small bit of interaction you do get, though, you find these two are brimming with personality, with opinions and feelings that go far beyond the surface-level, two-dimensional personalities you expect from NPCs with no narrative significance. She's a witch, I tell you. We shouldn't be talking to her. Quiet, Davith. If she's really a witch, do you want to make her mad? There is a smart lad. Sadly irrelevant to the larger scheme of things, but it is not I who decides. Believe what you will. That small interaction is really a microcosm of what's at play here. The world of Dragon Age is absolutely full to bursting with lore, be it folklore of regions around the world, the history of the world itself, the nations of Thetis, their religious beliefs, the mythologies of the wandering Dalish elf clans, the philosophies of the Kunari, or the society of Orzammar and the surface dwarfs, the different stances on the use of magic. I mean, seeing how faith, magic, and the interpretations of magic in society have been pivotal themes in each game moving forward, it's genuinely mind-blowing when you realize just how much of the world the creators behind Dragon Age had already figured out, even this early in the series' life. Many things would go on to be altered, edited, and in some cases retconned, but overall I think a lot of the core identity of Thetis has remained the same throughout the years. And what I have mentioned here doesn't even account for most of what you can do in the opening act of this game, and it doesn't even account for most of what you can learn in this world. Ostagar is host to so many fun little stories you can engage in, learning about ash warriors helping sick hounds, talking to the elven servants in camp, thievery, Meeting some of the important people in camp, getting their perspective on the Grey Wardens, Darkspawn, the upcoming battle, and much more. This was a masterpiece way to introduce the world, and Teenage Josh knew he was in for something special. I knew this was a game I was going to fall in love with, and a world I could really care about. Well, well. What have we here? It wouldn't be a classic Bioware game without companions and characters that really flesh out the world and have their own motivations, thoughts, feelings, and opinions on how best to handle the situations the party may find themselves in. Focusing on the companions in this section, you have Alistair, a Grey Warden like you, Morrigan, an apostate mage and witch originating from the Kokari Wilds, Leliana, a Chantry sister and rogue, Sten, a Kunari warrior and member of the Barisad, 
Ogryn, a dwarven warrior who was at one time considered the greatest warrior of his age, Zevran, an elven assassin and member of the Antivan Crows, the foremost assassins in the world, Shale, a war golem who is only available via the Stone Prisoner DLC, and well worth it in my opinion, Wynn, a senior enchanter and spirit healer from Ferelden's Circle of Magi, and Dog, who canonically should be named Barkspawn, a loyal hound that will follow you into battle, and is no slouch in combat either. Lastly, there is a secret companion, who can possibly be acquired via specific story elements near the climax of the game. I won't spoil who it is though, because when it comes up, I genuinely did not see it coming. It's pretty cool though, all things considered. The great thing about the companions is that they all offer their personal takes on things. Alistair, Leliana, and Wynne, for example, tend to be altruistic and selfless in their motivations. They generally occupy the morally good high ground of the party. Sten is more of a pragmatist. He isn't cruel or anything, but he favors direct action and doesn't enjoy having his time wasted or focusing on goals that don't directly combat the Darkspawn threat. This is a stance that is shared by Shale as well. She is also not the biggest fan of veering off the path, but in contrast to Sten, she's a bit more callous in her regard or disregard for others. Morrigan and Zevran are far more morally gray than the others, which you might expect from a witch and an assassin. While they aren't cartoonishly evil, more often than not though, Morrigan and Zevran will encourage you to take actions that are morally questionable at best and downright vicious at worst. To them, ends justify means. Ogryn is almost purely comic relief. He certainly has deep feelings and story and very good writing, but man, that guy is a never-ending onslaught of jokes and humor. He is a great contrast to the overall darker tone of the world set forth in Dragon Age. Obviously, there is more to Ogryn than jokes, but I'll leave that to you to discover. I do think you would be genuinely surprised by his character. While your companions and their suggestions can impact you as the player, whether you want to see how a situation will play out, or you genuinely agree with them, you as the player can impact them as well, sometimes changing their perspectives on a situation or their outlook on life. It's actually cool to see how your companions' character arcs can go different ways, and how you as their friend or even a rival can impact them moving forward, sometimes in ways that carry far beyond Dragon Age Origins. Some cases, all the way to Inquisition. One thing that has always stuck with me is the sense of agency you have in the world of Dragon Age. The fact that you can make a choice in Origins that can affect the story in Dragon Age 2 and even Dragon Age Inquisition gives you a measure of ownership in the world. I think it provides a level of investment in its story and narratives that you can't get from something like The Elder Scrolls or Fallout. No matter what, those games will have a canon ending and story, regardless of what content you choose to do or entirely ignore. While that is also the case for Dragon Age to some degree, there are plenty of decisions you make that you will directly see affecting the world, even up to 10 years later in the, in the series timeline. I think seeing the Warden's actions having an effect on Hawk's story, and Hawk's actions affecting the Inquisitor's story, and even the Warden's actions affecting the Inquisitor's story well over a decade later, provides a level of immersion and connection to your characters you don't get anywhere else. You shape the story, but also, the story shapes you. The replayability between the three games in this series is very extensive, at least for me. I imagine once Dragon Age The Veil Guard releases, we'll see even more reasons to go back and try new paths. Maybe go back to Origins and try that female city elf warrior you've always wanted to play. See the story from a different perspective and carry that on through the other two, soon to be three games. This replayability has encouraged me to play Dragon Age Origins, Dragon Age 2, and Dragon Age Inquisition many times, as many different characters, classes, races, and even personality types. It's amazing how choosing to pursue a game with a different personality encourages you to make choices you wouldn't normally make. Even more crazy to see how those choices affect the world in later games. One thing I've always done is base characters off of my friends. In Dragon Age Keep, my canon world state is one where my warden is a castless dwarf based on my friend Angel. While I change his name to make it a bit more dwarfy, his name is Anjek Braska. 
he chose to be a castless dwarf and told me the choices that he thinks would be fun for that story, and I played that story out, and I've always had a wonderful time. That's why it's my canon warden now. My champion from Dragon Age 2 is always named after my friend Lena. This character is a mage, and specifically has the sarcastic personality, but overall a good person. Her humor causes her a lot of trouble, but her levity has carried her through many adventures. Lastly, my Inquisitor is based off of my brother Brian. Brian is tall and skinny. Typical elf. While Brian tends to be a mage in games, I make him a rogue, that way I have one of each class headlining a major story. He is a solemn and serious character, focused on his goals and not giving much thought to things outside of his role as the Inquisitor. I have also switched up their roles and tried out different configurations like basing the Warden on my brother, or the champion off my friend Angel, or even just making new characters entirely for fun. It's given me so many years of enjoyment, and it all stems from this game here. From the love of the original minds behind Dragon Age, and the foresight they had to build Thetis into a believable fantasy setting. Shall I guess your purpose? You sought something in that chest? Something that is here no longer? Here no longer? You stole them, didn't you? You're some kind of sneaky witch thief. How very eloquent. How does one steal from dead men? Quite easily, it seems. One of the great things about this medium of entertainment we all have in common here is the ability to share these stories with friends. While you can discuss a movie or a TV show, you aren't part of the action. That's the joy of gaming. Gaming allows you to be a part of the action, and the reactivity of Dragon Age means two players can do the same quest, and it may come out vastly different from one another. Or it may happen in a different way, because you did one thing and your friend did something else, or didn't do something else, as it were. When I first started playing Dragon Age, none of my friends played, and nobody I knew even had a passing interest in it. But eventually I introduced a friend of mine, Angel, to Dragon Age, and he took to it immediately. One night, seemingly no different to any other, he came to the apartment I lived in, and I happened to be wrapping up my most recent gameplay session of Dragon Age Origins. He asked me what I was playing, and I gave him a brief overview of it, and he was super interested. I let him make a character, and he played for a couple hours that night, all the way through his origin story in the Battle of Ostagar before he eventually went home. A couple days later, I bought him Dragon Age Origins with the DLC in Dragon Age 2. GameStop down the street had them relatively cheap, so I got them to surprise him. Now at this point, I played through Dragon Age Origins and Dragon Age 2 multiple times, so the story wasn't new to me. I was just trying different combos of characters and choices to see what the narrative was like from a different point of view. But when Angel started playing, it really helped me recover, you know that spark you have when you play a game for the first time? I mean, subsequent playthroughs can be fun and, and all that, but there's nothing quite like playing it the first time. And when I played this game the first time, I loved it like anything else, but over subsequent playthroughs, it just became something that I knew how to do. And Angel was usually awake way later than me, so before he went to bed, he would always send me these incredibly long messages. We called them the Dragon Age updates. I would read them when I woke up, and I would respond in, in just as great a detail as he would message me. All of a sudden, his enthusiasm had infected me. I felt like I was playing the game for the first time again, and it was all because he was new to it and learning about Thetis and Dragon Age for the first time. I truly felt like I was seeing the world through his eyes. Those turned into long, late-night discussions and text threads where we would discuss lore, choices we made, and how they might affect Dragon Age 3. Because at this time, we didn't know anything about Inquisition yet, only that a third Dragon Age game was being made. I swear, we would go days without having a conversation significant to each other's lives. Sometimes, for like a week, there wouldn't be messages like, Hey man, how's your day going? Or, how's work going today? Hell, I wouldn't even message him to ask him to hang out. I knew how he felt. He just wanted to get home, play Dragon Age, and explore the world and setting more. Which is exactly what I wanted to do, because his newfound love had rekindled my initial spark. And I was playing Dragon Age as well, and all I wanted to do was get home and play it. 
For me, those moments with my friend Angel are so integral to my early Dragon Age experiences. Those moments of discussion, consequence in the stories, excitement, and adventure were pivotal in the early days of our friendship. While at the time I considered us friends, it was our mutual love of Dragon Age that drove us closer. For me, Dragon Age Origins is an origin story of one of my dearest friendships, a tale of a friend who became a best friend and later a brother to me. For I have seen with my own eyes what lies on the horizon. Maker, help us all. If you have never played Dragon Age Origins, I sincerely hope I can convince you to pick it up. I was thinking about this recently, and people who started with Inquisition and have only played Inquisition have been part of the Dragon Age community for 10 years now, which makes me feel even older having started with Origins, I think, as a teen. That said, I think this game is worth your time. This series as a whole is worth your time if you're a fan of RPGs, and if you enjoy the idea of a world that is influenced by your actions between games. This is truly a gem, and a game I've played many times over and will likely play many more. This game actually represents a shift for me. Dragon Age was my first step into buying games on my own as an adult with a measure of financial freedom. I had no hype or build up or time dreaming of playing this game beforehand. I just saw it, it looked cool, I bought it, and I was instantly a fan. More than that, this game was a cornerstone of one of my life's greatest and most enduring friendships. I hope you take the time to enter the world of Thetis and take the fight to the fifth blight. That way you can learn why I, and so many others love, Dragon Age Origins. Here we are, at the end of another one. Thank you! Thank you for making it this far! If you're here looking at me, that's so crazy. I just wanted to say a couple of things. Real quick, first off, I wanted to thank Lena, as always, who designs the thumbnails on this channel. She is truly the quiet powerhouse around here. If you saw this video while you were scrolling and it was the thumbnail that drew you in, that was all her effort, not mine. And thankfully, I got to hang out and see her recently. I, I flew back home up to Michigan and I saw her and my brother. They both lived there. And we had a wonderful couple days together. We had some great dinners. We spent a lot of time hanging out in downtown Detroit. It was, it was truly wonderful. So Lena, as always, thank you for all the work you do on this channel. It's, I, I could not thank you enough if I wanted to. Though I suppose if I had a million dollars, you'd 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 probably take that if I if I could offer it. But alas, I do not, my friend. All I have is my words. So thank you as always. And to you, the viewer, I have a couple things I want to say here. Always thank you. If you're here right now, you made it this far in the video. That's amazing, and I love you for it. I give you a big old kiss, but I don't want to get sent to uh, some kind of HR. But there's something I want to say here. My goal is always to be positive in these videos, but I, I want to say I did have a difficult time playing this game. If you're watching this on the day it releases, it is July 8th, Monday. And for EA, um, there's a sale on the Dragon Age series. If you use their app, that ends July 11th. I don't know when, yeah, the ad, it also ends July 11th on Steam. I have it pulled up. You can get Dragon Age Origins and all its DLC for $2.99. You can get Dragon Age 2 and all its DLC for $2.99. You can get Dragon Age Inquisition and all its DLC for $3.99. So for less than 15 bucks, you can get the entire Dragon Age series plus all the DLCs, and that is an amazing deal. But, but, I have been playing uh, Dragon Age Origins on PC for this video, and I gotta say, I had a very difficult time with that game. It crashed on me multiple times in the exact same place. I had a hard time getting cutscenes to trigger when I needed them, and um, I had just a horrible issue with textures uh, popping out of the game and or not loading in correctly. Now look, Dragon Age Origins was not a beautiful game at the time. Like, it wasn't a visual marvel, even when it came out in 2009. I felt like Mass Effect, the first one, which was in 2007, was a better-looking game in every, every regard. 
So I don't know if I can recommend this game on PC. The entirety of the time I've been playing Dragon Age since I first picked it up was back in... Oh, jeez, I forget when it was, but I think it was like 17 or 18. But when I picked it up, it's always been on Xbox 360 and uh, Xbox One that I've played all the Dragon Age games on. So it was really... Uh, I, I never had too many issues. I'm not saying there weren't problems, but the PC version quite literally plagued me. So if you want to pick it up, those are great deals for the whole series. I don't know how Dragon Age 2 or Inquisition run on PC. I don't know. I haven't tried them. But that's a good deal. Pick it up, but maybe look into mods for Dragon Age Origins to maybe get it running better. Some sort of stability or unofficial patch. I don't know if there are mods out there. I'm not in the modding scene. But that, if, if you're going to pick it up and this video inspires you to do that, definitely know that going into it. The PC version is, it was tough to play. I had a, I had a hard time with it. And I had something else I wanted to say too. When I make these scripts for these videos... I, I usually proofread them because I, I, I just write what I feel and then I go back and read it. Sometimes if I use one adjective or something way too much, I, I don't want to sound terribly uneducated because I am, but I don't want to sound like that. So I'll go through and I'll tweak them, but keep the same vibe to it, right? The script for Fallout New Vegas, that video, why I love Fallout New Vegas, was about 10 pages. And I swear I could have written so many more, but I, I condensed it. The one for... Oblivion, why I love The Elder Scrolls for Oblivion, was 14 or 15 pages. And this one for Dragon Age was only 8. And I looked at it for a really, really long time and I was like, do I not love Dragon Age Origins? Do I hate this game? And I realized what the difference was with this game compared to those other two. And I allude to that near the end of the script. And I just got a text. I allude to that near the end of the script for this video, how this was the first game I purchased where I had any measure of financial freedom. And that is true. And I guess I guess that's why this script was so much shorter, because I look back at the Oblivion in the New Vegas videos, there was like this long period of waiting and just anticipation, right? The excitement that we all feel as kids. This game was actually a shift for me. It was probably the first series I got into as a quote-unquote adult with their own money, where, you know, I, I had a few bucks, I saw something, I took a chance, and that gamble paid off for me, big time. So I think that's kind of a really neat thing, is this game was uh, not only foundational in a, in a great friendship for me, but it was also, it was also foundational in my adult life. It, that's what allowed me, um, well, it didn't allow me, having a job allowed me, but I took a risk and I, I got a new game out of it. And that was an amazing feeling because I was just, there was no period of dreaming about this game. It was just, I saw it, I got it. And that's incredible. Also, one more thing. I know this uh, little outro is way longer than they usually are. I made a friend via this game, a fellow content creator. Her name is Lilith. I'm going to link her channel below. If you're into Monster Hunter, Elden Ring content, Souls-like, and CRPGs, she does a lot of really great stuff. And I would appreciate if you would go subscribe to her because I've been watching her videos and she does some great live streaming and they are incredible. Lilith, I hope that somebody goes your way on this video and subscribes to your channel because it is truly a fantastic channel and I love whenever I see that you've uploaded. And you, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to this, I would genuinely appreciate it. You want to like the video too? Hey. I would like that as well. Just so you know, moving forward, I have other ideas for content that are not this same video essay format. I do want to play a couple other games and uh, try to get good at them. And just to keep you, the audience, updated, I'll let you know videos I'm trying to make next coming up. With the uh, aforementioned Lilith, I am talking about some Elder Scrolls Legends content. Not a card game kind of guy, but she seems very enthusiastic by it. And... I'm willing to try anything at least once, but um, games in my personal library that I'm th thinking about making videos about are Endless Space 2 and Star Sector. I don't know what form those videos will take, but as I work on them, I will keep you updated in the community tab. We also now have a Discord, and it's very dry. There's like maybe three of us talking in there, but it's a start, and I will link that 
down below as well. So more than anything though, if you don't want to join the Discord, subscribe or like the video, I am just so thrilled that you took time out of your day to be here with me and I will see you in the next video.